All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Martin, if you don't know me. I'm a senior computer science major in the five-year program as well, just like Brian. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about my research on NetScore. It's a joint project between myself, Dr. Jessalyn Carr, and Eric Gavilitz, who's now at Google. And my role in this project was doing the measurement platform uh, evaluation of NetScore and also doing all the writing. So it has kind of turned into my honors thesis, and that's what I'm going to be presenting today. So just give a brief overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to discuss a little bit of the background and why measurement platforms are important. Talk about the current state of the art and how people are currently measuring their broadband network performance. I'm going to talk about the architecture of NetScore and how we've sought to seek uh, or sought to mitigate some of the problems with the current state of the art. And uh, I'll do this by kind of going through some main observations and then I'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. So to provide some background, measurement platforms are important to three specific groups. They're important to people like you and I, who want to make sure that we're not being swindled by our internet service providers and making sure that we're getting the services that we're paying for. They're also, also very important for government regulators to protect consumers like you and I, but to also make sure that their populace stays well-connected and competitive in a global economy. And measurement platforms are also very important to researchers like me, computer scientists. We want to see what sort of network infrastructure is out there, maybe where we're lacking in infrastructure, and to gain some valuable insights about just the state of the internet today. So the key to having an effective measurement platform is to reach the corners of the internet and to have a very broad sampling of data. So how do we achieve this? We achieve it by having a low barrier of entry to clients. People should not have to take significant steps to take your test. And it should also be scalable at a low cost. We should be able to capture new populations by not having to you know, build large server infrastructure and paying high costs. So let's take a look at kind of the current state of the art, which is pretty much dominated by OOKLA speed tests. I'm sure most of us in this room are pretty familiar with OOKLA speed tests because most of us are pretty technically savvy. But to the average consumer, the average person, I know I've discussed my research with quite a few of my friends, and they've never heard of speedtest.net. So speedtest.net, there's an animated GIF in the corner of just kind of what it looks like. I'm sure most of you, again, are familiar with it. You select a server, or a server is selected for you based on latency, shortest distance. And uh, the tool will download a series of images and report a couple figures. It'll give you your latency or delay in milliseconds. It'll give your upload throughput and your download throughput in megabits per second. And uh, you take the test, you get the uh, results, and that's pretty much it. Now, OOKLA speed test is the most widely used measurement platform today. There have been over 7 billion tests to date, and it's even used by internet service providers to help their customers diagnose their connections. However, they have some possible biases. I mentioned that most of us in this room may know what OOKLA speed tests are, but you know, the average person may not. So there's a selection bias that favors technical users, and in this presentation I may refer to them as geeky users as well. And these are users like you and I, we have some working knowledge of networking and what these figures mean, but to most people, they don't know what latency means or what throughput means. There's also a conflict of interest that arises when internet service providers host OOKLA speed test servers in their infrastructure. So they could possibly monitor these links, recognize that people are taking these tests, and possibly prioritize traffic between the server and the client. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Measurement Lab. Measurement Lab has taken a large stride in expanding the research community around measurement platforms. It's built for researchers, and anyone can take the tests that are provided by tools that are deployed on their servers. So as a result, we kind of see a similar selection bias as OOKLA, because not only do you have to know about Measurement Lab, you have to navigate to their website, select the test, take the test, and that's quite a few steps. So if you don't really know what Measurement Lab is, you're not going to be included in their sample data. So to talk a little bit about NetScore's architecture and how we try to mit mitigate these biases is we really try to achieve that low barrier to entry. The users that take NetScore tests do not have to perform a single action. There's no additional software or hardware needed. You don't have to install a Flash plugin. And NetScore is not just for diagnosing connections. You, we embed the NetScore tool into third-party websites that people may browse and visit every day and their network performance is included in our data sample. We also leverage YouTube's content distributed network to keep costs low. Instead of retrieving images from a server here, 
we use YouTube to provide a server that's number one, close to the users, and representative of a typical path that a user might take while browsing the internet. It's inexpensive to all parties involved, and that's what I'm going to show you right now. To step through what it looks like to take a NetScore test, we have three parties involved. The user will contact the third party website that they want to visit, and they'll retrieve all of the objects necessary for the browsing of that website. Lastly, our NetScore tool is retrieved as well. We do this by embedding about six or seven lines of JavaScript at the end of an HTML file, of whatever page we want to embed our tool on. So, Due to the W3 standard and HTML is supposed to be rendered sequentially, the NetScore tool is retrieved last. Once the NetScore tool is retrieved, we issue a GET request for a very small image located on YouTube's CDN. We get an image back and we time this using the wall clock to account for any input output on the server side. Then we issue another request for a larger image. That larger image is retrieved. We do the same timing mechanism using the wall clock, but this time we correct for you know, the delay, possibly for that handshake, and then we divide the time that it takes to retrieve that file, or the size of the file, by the time it takes to retrieve it. So we also provide a throughput measurement as well. And so now let me explain why it's low cost to all parties involved. First of all, users do not see this test being taken. It runs in the background very similar to an analytics engine. So they do not notice any difference in their browsing experience. It's also low cost to the third party website that embeds the tool because not only is it a very small, lightweight tool, only six lines of JavaScript, but it also doesn't affect the website's UI. It's also inexpensive for us as maintainers of the tool because we're leveraging YouTube's content distributed network. All we have to do to scale up is embed the tool in another website, pay YouTube for the increased cost in using their servers, and we sit back and let the data collection expand. So to test this tool, we deployed on Tar Heel Reader, Dr. Gary Bishop's website, for seven months, starting January 1st, 2014, ending in August 1st, 2014. And if you're not familiar with Tar Heel Reader, it's an educational website for learning and practicing how to read by writing and reading short books. And the great thing about Tar Heel Reader is it has a global audience. Dr. Bishop sees visitors from all over the world on various degrees of hardware. So we embedded the tool on the site, and we got to see a broad audience on, from every corner of the globe and on various degrees of hardware. This is a picture of what Tar Heel Reader's landing page looked like, and I'm sure it looked no different with our tool deployed because our tool is not visible to users. And so hopefully I've kind of convinced you that we have a non-existent barrier to entry, and I want to talk about these next two points, about our data, that we're scalable to reach new populations, and we reached a global representation with minimal bias. So this is a plot of the number of users um, taking test, net score tests in North America, US and Central America. So uh, the legend kind of shows the number and the scale of what um, these icons mean. So uh, the yellow icons, there's uh, one to 10 tests taken in that city. And then as the icons get bigger, there are more and more tests taken in that city. So each of these dots represent the city. Also, you know, we saw pop, uh, representation in every country of the Americas, which was pretty cool. This is our, a map of our representation in Europe and North Africa. So again, we're seeing a lot of representation taking these net score tests, visiting Dr. Bishop's website all over the world. This is a map of our representation in East Asia. I want to point out those two lone dots in the Pacific are actually Guam. So we're seeing people taking these tests in Guam. We're including those people in our sample data. This is our representation in Oceania. Uh, I want to kind of point out the cluster of islands in the Pacific right there. Um, I think the upper, um, the one furthest to the right is Fiji. And the one in the middle is an interesting little town um, of Port Villa in the island nation of Vanuatu, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Also, all the major cities in Australia represented Perth, Adelaide, Victoria, New South Wales, Sydney. Um, so we had good representation pretty much in all corners of the globe. And so this is a bar chart showing the ratio of the countries represented by region. So as you can see, we had 100% representation in all the countries of the Americas, very high representation in East Asia, in Asia Europe, Oceania, 
Africa was not represented as much. Um, if we look at the map, uh, we noticed there wasn't a lot of tests taken in Central Africa, which is a population that we would certainly want to include. But that could have been due to two things. Number one, there may not be network infrastructure to access the internet in those areas. And number two, they may also just not have knowledge of Tar Heel Reader. So the great thing about NetScore is we could embed our tool in a website visited by people in that region and include their data in our sample as well. Now this is something that I really wanted to emphasize is representation in rural areas. So this is a you know, map of the southeast and I want to highlight two towns. The first one being the town of Waxhaw, North Carolina. This town has a population of less than 10,000 people and we saw four tests taken in this town. And even smaller is a town called Wingate with a population of only 3,689 people and we saw a test taken in this very, very small town as well. So to be honest, I don't see UCLA speed tests possibly being able to represent people in these towns. People in these towns may not know about speed tests on it. They may not have the infrastructure to really access the internet in the fullest. But they're accessing Dr. Bishop's site, which means they've taken our test, and we've been able to include them in our sample. And so what's the point? Like I said, these users are not likely to access speedtest.net, but they may be accessing other websites that we could capture their data on. So this is a breakdown of the representation that we saw in our data by platform. So we have three main platforms that we represented, desktop, mobile, and gaming. And so you know, we have our typical users, uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, people taking you know, tests just browsing the internet on their laptops. I also want to point out that the y-axis in logarithmic scale, so while these towards the right of the graph may be kind of low, they saw tests in the order of tens. Um, so we saw representation on all sorts of mobile platforms, from you know, iPad to Blackberries to Android phones to even Nokia Series 40 phones, very minimal hardware. These tests are possible to take on even your phones without downloading any app or any flash plugins, which is pretty incredible. Lastly, gaming platforms being represented in our sample was pretty incredible as well. These people are accessing browsers on their PlayStation 3s, on their Nintendo Wii U's, and taking these tests as a result because we don't require additional hardware or software to take our tests. Also want to talk a little bit about the autonomous systems that we saw. If you're not familiar with autonomous systems, they're groups and networks of computers that access the internet. So the, according to Cisco, there are currently about 22,000 autonomous systems that are reachable through the internet and publicly advertised. And so we reached 3,540 unique autonomous systems, and that's about 17% of the advertised and publicly reachable autonomous systems. So that may not be a super impressive number, but considering that we reached people across the world, that is a pretty big accomplishment for seven months on one website. So just to highlight some of these uh, autonomous systems, we saw the major three um, service providers represented, AT&T, Verizon, and Cox Communications. We also saw two educational autonomous systems, NC Ren and the New York Board of Education's autonomous system was very well represented. A lot of people that use Dr. Bishop's site are in the classroom, are educators, you know, people learning in the classroom. This is a cumulative distribution function of the median latencies that we saw across our sample. And the median latency in our data set was about 57 milliseconds. So we really saw a range of latencies, and that one ended up being the median. What's more interesting, though, is about 80% of our recording latencies were under 120 milliseconds. So people that are using Dr. Bishop's site and taking our tests are you know, able to do web browsing you know, fairly efficiently. That may be pretty slow, but it's still possible to web browse at that latency. The median throughput, though, was pretty interesting as well. So this is a cumulative distribution function of the values that we recorded. Again, like I mentioned, throughput was measured with wall clock, taking the size of the file that we downloaded, dividing by how long it took. And the median throughput was about 8.03 megabits per second. So this is actually a pretty good throughput. Most people pay their service providers for somewhere on the order of 10 megabits per second down to 20 megabits per second down. It's a pretty popular figure that's bundled with, with phone and cable. And about 80% of our recorded throughput values were under 20 megabits per second. So again, pretty popular figures for you know, renting or paying a service provider for that sort of speed. This is a map of the median throughputs across the globe. 
So as the icons get bigger, we see higher throughput values. So we see even gigabit links represented in our sample. The blue bubbles are. And I want to point out two interesting ones. You can see there's a, above, there was about a three gigabit link found in Mongolia and one found in, East, in southern India. So I actually uh, did a little bit of research, and I believe there's a military installation in that city in Mongolia. So that could be a possibility of, of how we recorded those measurements. Or maybe it's people using a proxy or spoofing somehow and tricking our tool into thinking that their speeds were faster than they are. Um, th same thing could be in southern India. Maybe they have very good infrastructure there. But what's more interesting is looking at the throughputs in our data set that were less than 500 kilobits per second. So these are areas that we could potentially identify where the infrastructure is lacking. So this is a great application of our tool. You can see some of the cities that are experiencing low speeds and possibly recommending the government to look into these areas or private investors to improve the infrastructure in these areas. This is a density coded heat map of um, the popular values that we saw in our data set. So to kind of explain what this graph is, on the x-axis is our median delay, and on the y-axis is median throughput. And as the region gets more red, we saw a higher density of tests in that area. So for example, in this region right here, we saw somewhere on the order of between you know, 100 to 1,000 tests taken that saw metrics in that little region specifically. So I want to point out a couple specific regions of this graph and kind of describe what you would, um, where you would fall for certain applications. So if you're kind of in this region, this would be good for gaming. You want low latency, you know, under you know, 20, 30 milliseconds. And pretty much a, a, a variety of throughputs would be suitable to gaming depending on which games you're playing. This region is pretty good for web browsing. You can kind of get away with uh, higher delays and maybe not as high throughputs. Um, so that's you know, a, a good region to be in if you're web browsing. And if you're streaming HD video, this is really the region you want to be in. You want to have throughputs of above you know, 20, 30 um, megabits per second. But you can kind of afford longer delays because of you know, queuing and buffering. So just wanted to point those regions out. And so we saw most of our users in this region right here, which is pretty good for web browsing. And that makes sense because they access Dr. Bishop's website and they took our test. So they are pretty much represented as web browsers in our sample. So that looks pretty good. Also, I've talked a lot about Tar Heel Reader's population. And that's you know, a real testament. You know, all the maps that I've had are just people that visited Gary's website. And now that is certainly a testament to their global audience. But what's important is that a NetScore can embed a tool in a website such as Tar Heel Reader and capture its users. Ookla Speed Test cannot boast something like that. They cannot embed their tool and not require their users to select a server or download a Flash plugin in order to run those tests. So to kind of wrap up, make some concluding remarks. NetScore has a low barrier to entry. We have no additional hardware or software that's necessary to take our tests. We're inclusive because we have that low barrier to entry. We can capture populations across the globe that are even on the most minimal of hardware. We've kept costs low. Server costs were only about a dollar a day to YouTube for the requests that we did. And it's no cost to the third parties that are hosting our tool. And scalability, like I mentioned earlier, we embed the tool in an additional website. We pay YouTube for the increase in server costs. And we do nothing but let the data collection happen. So our future work. We'd like to see NetScore embedded on more websites to test our deployment across multiple sites. And we want to formulate a specific score so that a new test taker can compare where their connection falls based on other test takers that have taken it in the past. I want to leave a few more minutes for questions. And thank you for your time. It runs in the background. So, so as soon as. No, right, correct. So you force the test on these people? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> necessarily, yes, necessarily. <laughs> the thing is, is we don't um, keep the last um, block of the IP address. So if there's any privacy concerns, there's no. It's all anonymous, but we do keep that data on a secure server in the department. So that's not as big of a concern. So for us. these side effects that you've done. What, what other kind of application do you think should also
also the hands side of things. What do you mean? So you mean I go to a website and you do things behind the, you know, that, that I didn't want to do. And, and, and you say it's good for society. Uh, are there other applications you can think of besides doing network tests that, uh, that you should force on people? Um, take, take your picture and send it to somebody. Right? <laughs> <laughs> good for society. <coughs> He's arguing very well that this is good for society. He could build a whole map of the world. Mm -hmm. oh, and by the way, I don't know how you did the test in China. They, they blocked YouTube. So. Oh, well, it's so I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but they did take the test. We did have representation in those areas. For, force the test. Please don't do <laughs> the test. Yeah. <laughs> Unwittingly, it took the test. That's fair. But I don't know how you got those dots there. You know? so, but I, I'm just curious. Are there other things you can imagine that are, you know, are good for people, like vaccination or something? Vaccination is certainly <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, when I take the Ookla speed test, I'm aware that I'm taking the test. So you, you know, don't do internet, you know, any other streaming or downloading huge files because you want to max your numbers out, right? Yeah. Here, when the user is not aware of taking the test, they could be doing other things which would pollute the results. But that's kind of the point. We want to capture the typical browsing experience of the people that are taking the tests or that the tests have been forced upon. <laughs> <laughs> How much data do So very small, actually. The images are on the order of bytes. The first image that's used to calculate latency is 362 bytes, and the image that's used to calculate the throughput is about 500 kilobytes. And how many times is this image downloaded? Uh, six times. Six times, so about three megabytes. Three kilobytes. Three kilobytes. Is it 500 so kilobytes? It's, re it's repeated a few times so that it's, it gives an average score. But the image is 500 kilobytes or 500 bytes? Um, kilobytes. 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 Well, the, well the, the first image is only 362 bytes, yeah. and the second image is five, yeah, so about so 500 three kilobytes. Megabytes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I pay Verizon about $10 a month to get a gigabyte. Then on my phone, right? You know, I'm yeah. a poor phone user. And so you used up about 0.3% of my data doing your test. So I mean, it really yeah. wasn't, you know, no cost to me, because I paid for the data, right? I mean, none of those schools paid for the data that I did. Uh, but if I was a phone user, I would actually pay for the data. That's, that's fair, yeah. Still good for society. <laughs> <laughs>